Welcome, my friends. Welcome to Worship with Christ Church United Methodist in Tucson, Arizona. I am Pastor Beth, and I want to let you know that whether you are a longtime member of Christ Church, a regular watching worshiper with us, or maybe you just stumbled across us for the first time on YouTube, we welcome you. If you are looking for a way to go deeper in your faith journey, Christ Church offers a number of ways to do that. Whether it's a prayer and ministry partner in our Stephen ministry, or a way to go deeper in world-changing service, Christ Church is here to help. Find us online at ccumtucson.org or check us out on Facebook. And now we worship together. Friends, as we continue this time of worship, let us organize the prayers of our thoughts and hearts as we do this call to worship. If you're reading along with this in your service bulletin, I invite you to read along with me. These words were written by Reverend Daniel B. Randall. Let us call ourselves into this time of worship together. We are met in the presence of God and we do not meet alone. With the angels in the highest heaven, we gather to worship the Lord. With Sarah and Abraham, we gather to worship the Lord. 
with the saints of every age, we gather to worship the Lord. We embark on our own faith journey. God's holy name be praised. God makes us a great people. God's holy name be praised. In the desert and in the city, in neighborhood and church, God's holy name be praised. We journey in the presence of God, and we do not journey alone. And now, my friends, we've come to that time in our service where we join our hearts in prayer together. This week, we are enjoying the words of Reverend Daniel B. Randall, and I invite you to lift up your own thoughts and prayers as we pray these words together. Pray with me. Generous God, you gave us our voices, no to the same. As you did with Abraham and Sarah, you take and touch our lives, and they become extraordinary. And in your church, you have gathered us. In your community of common folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people, you have called us and made a place for us. So let what we say and do here in our hearts, what we ponder and decide here in our thoughts, be real for us and honest to you as you prepare us for the life of the world in which you are praised. Amen.
scripture this morning comes from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And on him, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan, when they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages through the Negev. The next scripture is from Galatians 3, 6 through 9. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so, so you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who are blessed are blessed with Abraham, who believed. The next scripture is from Mark 11, verses 15 through 19. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And the evening came, and Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Blessings on the way. 
So this week, I will admit to doing something that I never before in my preaching life have done. I actually tried to find someone else's sermon to preach. I wanted something easy and already written. Let someone else bring the word and connect the dots and tell the story, I thought. You see, this week, I am definitely going through one of those weeks where you get the funk. Last week, I took a selfie of preaching to the vacant sanctuary where I record our Sunday services, and I realized that here we are in October, and I have yet to actually experience worship in this space. I've never gathered here with you in person. Each week, I look into this camera, and I try to imagine it's you, whoever you are hearing this, but this week, it isn't working. And the last thing I want to talk about this week is blessing. It is probably precisely precisely because the word this week is about blessing that I don't feel it and I don't feel like talking about it. It is like when you pray for patience. Have any of you ever done that? You say, dear God, please grant me the patience to endure this situation. Please enrich the patience of my life. And suddenly you find things so much more tedious and difficult than they ever were before. God grants us these gifts by helping us strengthen the muscles that recognize them. It is precisely because we are talking about blessings that I think this week has been so difficult. I suddenly have been incapable of seeing it. I scarcely feel it anywhere. I feel the crunch of uncertainty and the wilderness of the unknown. And the last thing that I feel right now in this empty sanctuary during this really difficult week, the last thing I feel is blessed. Now, I know you've had moments like that when blessings seem scarce. What do you do when you encounter those times? So one of the practices that I do is I go back and I look through old photographs or old writings of mine. I go out and I sit in my garden or I go for a walk with friends, which I can't really do during this time. None of us can. And this time, in order to endure this blessing scarcity I seem to be going through, I went back through old sermons, and I practically lost my breath when I came across one called Patient Zero, Epidemic Blessing. I couldn't believe that I had ever had the audacity to write out such a title for a sermon, And especially because I preached it in 2014 when we were in the midst of the Ebola epidemic in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria. But it got me thinking, what happens if we think about blessing as something that is even more contagious than, say, fear? or even more contagious than the coronavirus, what if blessing spreads invisibly and potently, and the more people who realize they have it, the more others catch it? What we see in the passage of scripture we heard today is God deciding on a new strategy for interacting with human beings. Each week we've encountered God's somewhat shifting strategy as he works with this confoundingly complex creature, the human being. Last week we talked about the tapestry of truths, how God weaves our human failings together with covenant to create something that is beautiful and enduring from generation to generation. This week, we see God set down the strategy that God will use from the time of Abram and the first call all the way to today. We see God choosing to use a human family, a human being, and deciding I will build my relationship with these people and all who are part of their family And through them and their relationships, the way they interact in this world, I will bless everyone. 
In Galatians, we see Paul working to tie the recent emergence of Christians after the death of Jesus into this ancient family of Abraham. It is almost as if he's contact tracing his way back to the first case of God-given blessedness that spread like light in a sunrise across the horizon of humanity once it had been unleashed. These stories of our sacred past bring us face to face with the reality that to every generation and every age, the good news proclaims in the face of life distorting death, that God is more powerful than the things we are enduring in this moment. It declares that blessing lives in the ability to see hope amidst despair, to find courage in the face of catastrophe and declare potential. It lives in our willingness to let joy, not just happiness, but joy and not grief, overwhelm us in the passing of time. Blessing is the power of God that we are baptized into when we enter the waters of our faith. And when we remember with gratefulness and promise our own baptism, that we belong forever to God, the Father, who I've chosen to call in the Lord's Prayer, eternal creator, because that is God's first relationship with us as the one who creates potential. And we remember God, the son, the one who meets us every week in Jesus Christ, our humble redeemer and teacher who walks with us. And God, the Holy Spirit, our everlasting sustainer, who gives us breath for life and spirit for play, no matter what's happening. We start this week's scripture with God asking a man named Abram and his wife, Sari, to leave behind everything, their lives, their extended family, their relative comfort, everything. Maybe Abraham in this story isn't just patient zero in the epidemic of blessing, but rather Abraham is showing us that it is when we leave the confines of our comfortable world that we encounter the Holy One who made covenant with us to bless us through the unknown and through the relationships with each other that sustain us in that adventure. And in doing that, God doesn't just bless us, bless our endeavors, God blesses the whole world. I think that Jesus in this part of scripture about the temple today confronts our habits, our sanctuaries of practice, our changing tables where we try to convert blessing into something we can trade and sell, give to others for a price. And Jesus throws these ideas over angry that we would try to turn covenant into cash, blessings into business. My house, Jesus says, is to be a place of prayer for all nations. He reminds us, he reminds us that we must stand convicted by these words because we may want the alchemy of position to be real, that somehow I can turn having into security, actual safety, comfort, and prosperity. I want my diligence in reading scripture, in prayer, in cultivating knowledge, and showing up to the work. I want that to deliver me from suffering. But that is not what blessing does. Because blessing doesn't make the road easier. It calls us to the road. It doesn't create comfort. It doesn't speak of safety because blessing only happens when we are on the way, when we are traveling on our way out of the land we have lived in for 70 years, on our way out of established ways of being that we thought were, would last forever, on the way to the cross 
on our way as disciples to Emmaus. Blessing, our birthright, is what we give to others, and it is what we get when we are on the way. Amen. My dear friends, we have come to that time in our relationship together where we start to talk about stewardship, what it means to prayerfully consider how we will use our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness to continue to extend the life of Christ Church United Methodist. There are so many ways in which your gifts are currently at work in the church. I'm standing in a sanctuary right now that is maintained by our trustees, by the gifts that you have given. We have enjoyed music today that is played and brought to you by staff members who are paid by the gifts that you give. You have heard a sermon and a worship service brought to you by volunteers giving their time and their talents and their energy to making it happen. All of this exists because you give. And so I hope that this month you will prayerfully consider what your gift to Christ Church will look like next year. If you're anything like me, you have experienced a devastating financial change in the year of 2020. And if you're anything like me, you know that God will see us through this time. And so I ask you to be with me and I promise I will be with you in prayer as we consider what gifts we shall give and how we shall support this church and all of God's ministries through it. We give because God has given all we have to us so that we might share our gifts. Praise be to God. Amen. And now, as children convinced of the goodness of God, whose first relationship is with the one who gives us life, let us boldly pray together. Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. finally receive this benediction. May the God of promise fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.